Hi everyone! Today we will be focusing on this aquarium, the Shell Dweller Aquarium. A few uh, months, no actually two years ago, I made a video about my tropical planted aquarium. And um, I was explicitly not going to talk about this aquarium, some of you might remember. Now, today the day has come that I am going to talk about this aquarium, although in the last two years this aquarium has seen quite some changes. So this is an aquarium uh, filled with shell dwelling cichlids, Neolamprologus multifaciatus, also known as multis, which are a really cute, nice, fun little fish. Um, but we'll talk, talk more about that later. I just fed them by the way, so that's why they're swimming up to the water surface to get some of the dry food I fed them. This aquarium, and then I mean the glass of the aquarium specifically, is actually um, what got me into biology in the first place a long long time ago. I think I may have already told this story, but I'll just tell it again anyway. When I was about four years old, one of the windows on my house broke. Um, and instead of throwing away the big shards of glass, my uh, father decided to make them into an aquarium, which turned out to be, to be this aquarium. And then he filled it up with all kinds of pond life and tadpoles and leeches and all kinds of stuff. And I became fascinated with that with that entire ecosystem inside of this glass box. And that is what kickstarted my passion for biology. So this is the aquarium I've had for the longest. And nowadays it's home to these shell dwelling fish. When you saw this aquarium two years ago, it was sitting beneath my tropical planted aquarium and you could see all kinds of plants and there, was, there were also guppies in there. I've had guppies, uh, a specific strain of fancy guppies. I think they were metalhead yellow laced snakeskin guppies. I had them together with these shell dwelling cichlids and it went okay, um, but in the end I decided to get rid of the guppies and turn this into a species only tank because I think that it would be better for both the guppies and for these cichlids. And I'm very happy with how that turned out. These fish are native to Lake Tanganyika, which is a very large lake in Africa. And it has very basic water, uh, a pH of about 9 or 10, and also very hard water, it's very mineral rich water. And therefore, it could be a quite a difficult fish to breed in captivity. However, these fish I've got here have been living uh, on Dutch tap water for so many generations that they are just used to a pH of about 7 and uh, I'm not even sure how hard the water is here because I just put uh, tap water into the aquarium. I don't have to treat it or anything. That's one of the great things about living in the Netherlands. The tap water is aquarium safe. And they just breed and they breed like crazy which is one of the things these fish do if they feel healthy and happy. And um, I also have a, a thermostat with a heater in this aquarium, but as you might be able to see, it's covered in algae, meaning it's not working. So um, these fish actually have been living not even heated and they're still breeding. So I think that's really nice. It shows, it, it shows in a kind of way, uh, evolution on a small scale because the fish that were able to breed in conditions that were not exactly the same as the conditions in the lake where they're originally from they uh, got to produce offspring and those offspring were then also able to breed in in new conditions and so on and so on and so now these fish have completely adapted to living on Dutch tap water which I think is really really interesting to see they uh, live in very large beds of empty shells of a specific snail genus. That's not the snail or the shell that I have in here. What I have in here is just shells I found on the beach here. But it it's really, really doesn't matter to them. Some breeders actually breed them in small L pieces of PVC tubes. So 
as long as they can get into them, they're just happy with it. Um, and they also have a large sand bed because they move sand around. Um, so all the, the little patterns in the sand you see here, they made that. I didn't do anything. And what I've, I haven't been able to find online, but what I've seen from my own experience is that they really like to kind of dig away the sand around the shells where they live so that the, the shells fall in some kind of pit and then they have large hills next to them. So they're kind of surrounded by sand and in a, in a little valley for themselves with their shell. I've also, when I just got these fish, I had two large males. One lived on this side of the tank, one lived on this side of the tank. And together they built a really large dividing hill. It really went up to here. It was quite a sight to see. Um, and they are constantly moving sand, putting it in their mouth, spitting, spitting it out somewhere else but also moving sand with their entire body. It's really fun to watch, they're always active. Now, initially I wanted to have uh, only sand as a substrate, but as you can see now I have plants in the aquarium. And that is because um, I've got some trouble, or not really trouble, but there's a lot of uh, blue algae or cyanobacteria growing in this tank. You can see it on this shelf, for example, um, which isn't really a problem uh, on itself, but I just think it doesn't look that nice. So I wanted to do the biological thing and I didn't want to put any kind of chemicals in the aquarium. I wanted to think about it from an ecological standpoint and try to solve the problem that way. So I added initially I think only one or two of these plants which is a type of Echinodorus. Um, and the, the reasoning was that for uh, cyanobacteria to grow really well three things need to happen. They need to have plenty of light, plenty of heat, they uh, have a an optimal curve and I think their preferred temperature is somewhere like 30 degrees which is also why uh, blue algae blooms are most prevalent in summer and they need to have enough nutrients. These plants help in lowering the amount of nutrients in the water because they take up these nutrients which uh, and then these nutrients can't be used by the algae anymore. They also cast a little bit of shade on the sand, but that, I think that's neg negligible. I also had floating plants in here for quite some time. I had water spangles, water lettuce and frogbit, I think. Um, and that worked really great. There was no uh, blue algae at all, but um, it, made, it made it so that the tank was really dark, which I didn't like. Um, so eventually I decided to get rid of it and then the the cyanobacteria became really prevalent again. Um, I also do a lot of water changes, again to take out the nutrients of the water and I turn the, uh, the thermostat really low, but it's broken anyway now. So um, that's how I just, I'm trying to uh, get rid of the uh, cyanobacteria in this aquarium. But uh, like I said, the cyanobacteria in this aquarium is only really a problem for me because I think it doesn't look that nice. The fish don't mind at all. Um, the plants mind a little if, the, if, a, if a biofilm starts forming on their leaves. But as you can see, the fish are really happy. They're breeding like crazy, which is always a good sign. Uh, I intentionally leave some of the... Uh, the uh, cyanobacteria and also other algae on the shells so that the, the baby fish, the fry, can eat all the tiny little microbes living uh, inside of the algae because um, if you have a lot of really tiny cichlid fish like these uh, and the fry of those it can be quite difficult to feed them. You could, there's all kinds of stuff you can add to them but you know me by now uh, I like to do things the ecological and the biological way, so um, I always leave growth on the shell so that there's microbes in that growth 
with which then the fry can feed on. Another thing that I did to try to get rid of the cyanobacteria is adding snails. There's two uh, species of snails in there and as you can maybe see from there, there's quite a lot of them because they've, I think I added one of each species and they've really started to reproduce like crazy because they had a lot of food, the, the algae mats. Um, and that's working quite okay. I also added uh, or tried to introduce cherry shrimp to this aquarium to try to get rid of the algae, but not quite unexpected. The fish didn't really allow for shrimp to be there, so that was a bit of a failure. Um, they are really quite territorial and aggressive, so the shrimp didn't really stand a chance. And also, the, they're actually quite territorial towards snails as well, which is funny to see. When a snail uh, moves close to their shell, they will pick it up with their mouth, swim away to the other side of the tank and then spit it out again. So yeah, let's talk about some of the other inhabitants in this aquarium. We have the fish, the plants, the entire microbial community. We have the two snail species. And then there's also this little bug, the common water strider, Garus locustris. As far as I know, it's quite unusual to have water striders in aquariums, especially one with a lid and as small as this one. It's also not a fluke that this one's in here. I have one or a couple of them in here every summer. I feed these fish wild caught live foods, such as daphnia and copper pods and water mites every summer. And I guess I must catch an egg or a nymph every so often which then develops into an adult like this one. But it's a really unusual and cool inhabitant of this aquarium. Something that I forgot to mention, but which is worthwhile mentioning, is that this is one of the smallest, if not the smallest, uh, species of cichlid. Um, this one, for instance, is an adult male, and it and I know that it is a male because it's larger than adult females get. It, um, and this is as big as they get. They're really, they won't get any bigger than this. And that is in captivity. In the wild, they're even smaller. Um, and that is one of the great things about these fish. If you don't have a lot of space, this is not a big aquarium for cichlids usually, you still can have cichlids. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, cichlids are also... Cichlids are always just special in a way. There's something about them that makes you want to keep watching them for some reason. So I think it's really great to be able to have actual cichlids in a, a tank this small. It's 80 centimeters by 30 by 30 centimeters. There's quite a few of them in here now because they've had over the past months they've had a lot of babies um, and I will get rid of some of the babies or some of the larger ones because if every single fish in here turns into a, an adult then it would be quite a large colony which is really awesome but a bit too large for this aquarium so for those that may have been worried about that don't um, I'm keeping it in mind I'm taking care of it but yeah, they form large colonies and, for instance, these small fish live in these, these shells. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are only raised and protected by the adult fish that live in these shells. The entire colony, all the adults, protect all the other fish. They're really territorial and aggressive. They're not afraid to take on fish that are five, six, seven times their own size. Um, they protect their babies at all costs. Really, they're just a fashion, uh, fascinating, a fascinating little fish to watch. They never fail to entertain. They're, they're never boring. Um, and by now, they're used to me being there. If they're not used to uh, a person being there, they will stay in their shells all the time. So if I can try to spook them, but I'm not really successful. Ah, a bit. And then they all duck back to their shells. Um, but as you can see, they come right out because by now they know that there's no danger here. 
And I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say about this aquarium for now. Thank you very much for listening to this incoherent rant. Um, I hope it was somewhat enjoyable. Um, and I'll see you in the next video.